Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Black Mold by Terrible Games. It plays two to four players, takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour to play, and it's for ages 13 and up. And in the game Black Mold, you're a prisoner trapped in a cell. And all of a sudden, one of the other prisoners pops through a door and unchains you, and suddenly dies there. You, now free to roam about the underground complex, or cave if you will, uh, have to try and escape. But you notice something weird. No Nobody is there. Everyone is dead except for you and maybe some companions. And you start smelling this awful stench, the stench of a mold that appears to have killed everyone and everything in its path. Will you escape the black mold, turn into a fungal parasite, try and kill your friends, or manage to escape the compound of black mold? Find out in the game. Let's talk about the setup, how to play, and of course my review. To begin setup for Black Mold, the first thing you'll need to do is build the deck in which you are going to traverse the Black Mold dungeon. You'll start by placing the exit on the bottom, and you will take the entrance and place it on the top. Then you are going to gather 10 cards for each player, separating them by stairwells, and then place this deck together to combine one singular deck of cards, in which case you're ready to begin by flipping over the starting area after reading it. Now, additionally, you can choose to play with event cards, and I strongly urge that you do. You'll take the deck and you'll set it next to the deck of locations. Take all the tokens that you would be using in the game and set them aside within reach of all players, all the item cards, as along with the torches set aside, and then, of course, your thralls and the attack dice. Then, as for characters, each player is going to select a prisoner, and that prisoner is going to have a bunch of different stats on them, and on the back, a thrall character. Go ahead and simply set it on the prisoner side, as well as giving yourself a turn structure card, and a bonus card, this is like your treasure you start with at the beginning of the game, that gives you a unique passive ability, which is explained in the book which one you start with. Take your decision deck and place it to one side, and take out all of the confusion cards, these cards with the black lining, and set them aside away from your deck. Shuffle your deck and place it down next to your character card. The last thing you do for your character is you'll take one of these cards here. This will explain what you can do to craft in the game. Set aside the thrill cards, which will be used for later, and begin the game. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so gameplay. The first thing that you're going to do is choose one of those starting players, and then you're going to give them their turn structure card that they're going to follow. On the first round of the game, you will not follow the heal, interact, craft, slash, ditch, slash, equip actions, but you'll just start with the inhale and move down. But I'm going to go over everything. I just wanted to point that out. The first thing is healing. You'll be able to roll dice, and based on the number of hearts you get, you're going to be able to heal yourself. If you are in a safe passage room, or like a location in which is kind of a safe room with a bonfire, you can get bonus die based on certain symbols that are open on your character card that are going to allow you to heal even more. However, when you heal, there's also a possibility that you might take damage instead when you roll these spore markers. After healing, you're going to interact. Interacting is basically allowing you to fight other things or other players. You'll be using your stats to do so. It's not usually used all that often, but when it is, it's important because no, most of the time you're having to steal something from somebody else to win, or you have to try and defeat a thrall just constantly trying to do damage to you. Crafting, ditching, equipping items. These are all basically the same thing for putting things on your player area or discarding them from your player area or making things with your player cards in your player area. You will have two zones on your player. One is the left and one is the right. These are your equip slots. You may only have two equipped areas and they may, have di they may only have different items. So you can't ever equip the same item twice. You'll also have two on the bottom on each side and those are face down. Those are like the hand that you're going to have that you can use to craft with. You'll never have more than six items, and if you ever have more than six, you'll have to ditch them. And of course, you're also going to be able to combine these items with use of this little tracker here to make things like a torch or a bonfire or a knife, or of course, even a shawl that's going to allow you to prevent you taking damage on locations. Um, after you've done that, you're going to move into the most the, the most like useful aspect of your turn. It's the main portion of your turn. It's called the inhale and the exhale step. In the inhale, you're literally just breathing in and holding your breath. And as long as you hold your breath, you can do the two actions I'm going to describe below. And then of course, exhaling is when you're going to end step. As soon as you hold, uh, exhale, you're basically ending that, that phase and whatever you're doing just simply stops. 
Now, we're going to talk about traverse first. This is where you're inhaling, you're holding your breath, uh, and you're attempting to do these things here. So traversing. When you want to traverse, the first thing that you'll look at is the location that you're at. Most of the time on a safe space, it's a free location and you can simply move to the next location. So I'm going to use white as an example. Basically, you'll take the top card of the traverse deck and you will place it down on the cave and you can kind of inherently place them wherever you want as long as they kind of connect. So the labyrinth is gonna kind of spiral in ways, but you'll see it's kind of intuitive. When you place down an entrance, you'll put another entrance next to it and then you'll move into that location. Next, you'll check the location again. Does it have a traverse check? There are two types of checks in locations, but they might not always be present. Sometimes they're dead ends or sometimes they have no search. A traverse is going to have a number that is written in white. The search will have a number that is in black with a searchlight over it. Your search check or your traverse check is what you're going to be using to determine if you can get to the next location. What you're going to be doing is with one hand, you will take this deck here and you will flip cards over from the top of it and place them down trying to attach them adjacently. Sometimes they're going to be top, bottom, or middle. When you have reached the criteria or the check, this area is a check of two, but let's just say it was a check of three. You would combine these guys up, say that you've completed it without saying it, discard these cards, and then you can move to the next area. So you're just trying to align the cards in this deck horizontally in order to get to the next location based on the number. You'll then flip over the card. Okay, another location. Now, let's say that you're about to run out of breath, or you're running out of breath pretty quickly. You might not want to move to another location. Instead, you can do a search action. You can take die equal to the equal to two plus the number on your character card. And I want to make sure I get this one right. Okay, it's teardrops. And in this case, you're gonna get two teardrops for the start, plus the number you have on your board, which is gonna be four for this character. So I would have all six die. When performing a search check, you'll take all of these die, you will roll them and then you will calculate. If you have teardrops, they're going to remain in play, and if not, you will keep rolling. However, if you ever hit one of these spores, you're going to be taking damage, and you can always choose to stop if you do not want to continue. In this case, my search check is three, so I would want to roll again, and hopefully get a drop. I did not, so I would roll again, and you would just keep simply doing this over and over again until you've managed to get that number or higher. I've gotten four, I didn't get any spores, so that would end my search, I would stop, and I would draw a card from the search deck and place it anywhere next to my player or beneath my player card. And then I can continue to traverse or search as long as I want, as long as I can hold my breath. For those of you who do not like to hold your breath, instead you can use this timer here. It simply flips and then when it runs out, that is going to end your turn, which means you're never gonna have to worry about reflipping and flipping because people are gonna to continue to use this up until the point where the timer has been emptied. After you have chosen to do your search and your traverse actions, you'll move on to your exhale, which is obviously <sighs> Then you'll be able to craft, ditch, and equip items once again, any of the new ones that you've gotten, and of course interact. Maybe you're going to be stealing something from an opponent or you're going to be doing damage to a thrall. After that, your turn is over and it will progress to the next player and it will simply continue from there. If a player is behind other players, which is possibly going to happen, they're still going to need to perform the same search and traverse checks along the corridors as the game progresses. You can always do a search check on a location, but only once every turn, and you must perform a traverse check if there is a traverse number on the card that you are on. Additionally, you're going to be able to run into stairs in the game, and when that happens, once everybody reaches those stairs, the rest of the cards that were previous to those stairs are going to go away, shortening the length of the board, making it easier for play. And of course, when you run to the end of the board here, that is going to allow you to escape, along with any other player who's able to do so. If you escape with the most nugs, you're the winner. If everyone escapes with the same amount of nugs, they're all the winner. And of course, if the throw player is able to kill all the other players, or throw players are able to kill all the other players, then the thralls are going to win the game. So it's kind of a cooperative, semi-cooperative game. To note too, there are different aspects in the game you'll be utilizing, like for instance, sometimes when you roll a spore to heal and that's a fail, you're going to summon thralls. There are also other ways you're going to summon thralls as well. But if you summon a thrall on your location, it's going to attack you. It will roll all of these dice here, and if, they get, if you get any spores, that is going to take spore damage. 
Let's talk about damage now as well. Damage is going to be represented by malice and spores. Spores are simply going to go onto your player board and block each of the spaces all the way around in a clockwise order from the top left all the way to the middle bottom. And when all the white spaces on your board have been filled up, you are dead. Additionally, if you take malice damage, you're simply going to place a malice token on your player board. Whenever a token covers one of the spaces that has a symbol, that symbol will not be in use until you are able to heal. If you die, you will become a thrall yourself. You will remove your character from the game, you will place down a thrall character in your location, and you will interact as a thrall. You'll be able to basically move and attack or use one of these cards here. When you use one, it'll go away. And when you are done with your cards, you're simply going to get them back into your hand and continue to be able to use them. These are really bonkers. They're really, really powerful. And that throw player will be in control of the throws for the rest of the game. Another thing to note too is when you go to a location, if you want, this is optional, if you want to play with this or not, you can take one of these cards here. These are event cards that take place. Sometimes they're going to be thralls that spawn in your location. Other times they're going to be riddles or literally dead cards that do nothing. You'll, th you'll see that in the campaign. They're very interesting. And most of the time you're going to follow these events. Events will basically end your turn. Well, not, not most of the time, a good amount of time. You'll get these events. And these are going to end your turn. You'll have to exhale when you get them. You will read the criteria and then choose an answer before reading the solved answer text. You shouldn't do that. You should just choose your answer based on how you want to choose it. And you'll suffer the penalty or gain rewards from doing so. And if you do not want to play with these, you don't have to. You can obviously set these aside, but I prefer it for gameplay experience. And that's basically the gameplay in a nutshell. There's obviously more things to the game, but I'm going to talk about a lot of that stuff in my review. But yes, you're just simply going to heal and interact and craft on your beginning turn before you inhale. And then you're going to inhale, you'll be moving along the board, and then you're going to, of course, search as well, trying to gather items from each space that you come across, exhale, and then perform those actions once again that you found at the very beginning. And players will continue until somebody escapes, or all players escape, or all players die. So Black Mold is all about you and your friends, potentially friends, trying to escape the Black Mold in the, the dungeon that you were in and escape. And the main aspect of the game is going to be inhaling and exhaling. It's basically a breathing game. But if you do not like that, and I personally do, you can use this timer. Basically, it can be turned into a timed game where you have so, many, so much time to perform the actions before the timer runs out. That, that's cool. I personally just like the holding your breath aspect. But for those of you who have problems or trouble holding your breath, please use that instead. So gameplay wise, uh, the traversal is pretty simple. Being able to take this stack of cards here and flip them over. Uh, I, didn't forget, I, got to, I didn't forget to mention, I'm going to mention all the little details in this specific review portion, but when your deck runs out as well, so you have a certain number of cards in your decision deck, when this empties, then you're done. You're not going to be able to continue your turn with the traverse action, but you can always roll dice for searching and you can always choose to stop as well. You can always choose to stop uh, uh, to traverse as well. You don't ever have to do these things if you want to stop. Maybe you're taking too much damage from searching, whatever it might be, you can always stop. Um, I didn't, I didn't I mentioned this lightly, but like there are the three three things on your on your board here: fit, wit, and grit. And uh, details on your player reference, what most of them do, or what happens when you cover them up. Like your heart, your attack score is going to be decreased when everyone gets covered. An eyeball is your defense score is decreased and you'll add a confusion to your deck. And then this one here, your little teardrop is going to say your overall combat ability is decreased and remove one survival die for your search checks. And th that's the same thing. It's the opposite for keeping them on the board as well. Now, let's, these guys here, because we're talking about how the fact that if you close and lose an eyeball, basically you're have to add one of these cards here, these confusion cards, you'll take this card and add it to your deck here and they remain in play permanently. So even if you uncover that eyeball again, it's still going to stay in your deck. And whenever you come across a confusion card when you're dealing these guys out to traverse the dungeon, you just discard it. Most of the time, if you can't use a card in this deck, you're going to discard it. These are basically going to be added to waste your time and confuse you a little bit while you're attempting to try and make it or traverse through this dungeon. This is all kind of an experience that you are playing as well. It, you, if the game wants to kind of confuse you in some ways, it wants to kind of trick you, wants to mess with your mind, you're going to be receiving unique things in this game, from especially this event deck, that is going to make you very, very, very like confused, literally. Like you're looking around the card while you're holding your breath, your heart starts pumping and you find the words heal two damage and it's the last two damage you need to heal that two damage to survive the game 
it, it can come down to moments like those. This deck here, the locations deck, while most of them are pretty simple and straightforward, some of them are a little tricky too, where you're not going to realize that there is a way you can get across, or this might be a safe space, etc., etc. And I love that aspect of this game. I, I, I love the, 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 the feeling you get when you play this game. I think that really shines. The, the, these items as you gather and search, sometimes you're just going to straight up get a really powerful card like a knife for extra damage, or other times you might get a beetle, which is great for healing or eating if you need to, and most of the time you're going to get items that will allow you to craft these items. And of course, if you can get that lit torch, it's very powerful. It'll allow you to ignore holding your breath, move three spaces on your turn, and potentially even defeat the, the thralls. Thralls will generally die by fire. Uh, I think the torch gives you plus three damage to thralls. When Whenever you want to kill a thrall, you'll need to have eight straight damage on your player board plus any items that you have. But otherwise, every time you walk into a space with one of these guys, they're going to deal damage to you. And it's this like, what am I going to get when I do this thing? Is it going to be a good thing? And you never know. And that's kind of the interesting thing about the game, which changes it every time you play. Yes, you might see the same event cards here or there, but you're going to always have these unique locations to pop up with the events. And then, of course, drawing certain things that might give you a benefit. And it just has this unique flavor to it. This feel is really, really nice. Um, each player is going to come with their own passive card as well. When healing, you choose which damage is removed. You might not think that's very useful, but in fact it is, because if you start taking damage and you start losing your fit, or maybe your grit, or whatever it is that you want to hold on to, you can choose which one to get rid of and which ones to keep. So you might have some damage here on the top, but you might have got rid of some of these in the middle because you need these symbols in order to progress in the game. And as you take damage in this game, things do not get easier. It's a snowball effect, but downwards. So you always are trying to decide how much do I want to push, how much do I not want to push, and how much am I willing to sacrifice for items. Uh, another thing to note too is when you are going through this game, it's it's you're, you're attempting to like stave off damage and there are different locations in this game that will give you damage. So every time you exhale, you have to check which location you're at. And there's a ton of different locations in the game. The most generic locations are just going to make you take a spore damage. You'll take one of these little spore markers and you'll cover your player board up in the health area. And, uh, it's not super bad. You can always like kind of recover from it, but there are nastier spaces. There are going to be like these really like basically coughing fits, these things that are just really nasty, where when you walk in, walk out, begin or end your turn on those locations, you'll take a damage. And there's lots of ways that that can happen. Um, there's safe rooms. Safe rooms are going to allow you to heal without the negative addition of rolling a spore die and summoning something uh, nasty. Um, and of course, you'll be able to attempt to cross the locations, these little like bridges that will get you further and further out of the dungeon, uh, which, which is nice. There's, there's, there's enough variety there where I think you're going to be seeing some new things and little twists and turns as the game progresses. Something else I almost forgot to mention that's really cool about this game is you are playing for yourself, attempting to escape. And of course, maybe you can get some currency along the way. But you also have other players, and sometimes you'll actually need their help. So if you go out of your way to hurt them too much, they will not help you in certain instances that you might need somebody else to get your back. You're not going to simply be able to survive this game on your own most of the time. And sometimes you're going to need assistance. You're going to not want to traverse too far from the others. There is a fast travel system that is going to allow you to get from one location to the stairs, but it's a little bit challenging, and you can look at that up in the rules how that works. But it allows you to fast travel. It's pretty simple. Um, However, the, there are moments in the game where you'll want to steal and kill your allies, and that might be a good thing. There are moments in the game where it's, you're going to need them, and if you've burnt too many bridges, you're screwed. You're in deep trouble, and no one's going to come and benefit you along the way. So it's best to kind of feel this game out as like a cooperative, semi-cooperative game, but... If everyone's going to die, then you might as well try and live. You know, if you need to steal that torch and he's prob Billy's probably going to die there anyway, then you take care of Billy and you get the heck out and maybe the others will forgive you as you progress throughout the caverns for the rest of the game. Uh, just remember, though, that uh, revenge is, is a wheel, you know? <laughs> so, so be aware of that. But it, I love the idea of, like, working together, but not necessarily working together, and I thought I'd bring that up. Overall, it's a pretty straightforward game. I mean, the main actions you're going to need to really think about are your traverse and search. Everything else is just kind of attached to it. Healing, interacting, crafting, and then you, you do your main actions of the game, and then you craft and interact, and then you're done. Um, but that being said, the experience is 
is, is exciting. Being able to feel like you're confused or your heart gets pumping or you get nervous, that adds to this game. That game, this is a game has that type of flavor. For those of you gamers who like the mechanic of holding your breath, this is going to be a solid choice for you. For those of you who want to use the timer, I actually had two people play previously with the timer and they still really enjoyed the game and liked having to look at the cards and speed things along. That being said, let's talk about some other stuff now. The gameplay is good in my opinion. The, the, the artwork here. It's dark, it's gritty, it's confusing, it's, it's weird, and it fits in with the theme. You feel yourself in this game attached to the mechanics, which is really, really cool. Uh, the artwork is well done, is really well put together. Uh, the cards are pretty straightforward. There are a few cards in the deck here, which were harder to tell, like which one of these is a spore location, which one of them isn't. There's a, a slight aspects to that, um, but overall, it's, it's really high quality, uh, the components. Everything here is top notch. The, even the insert in the box is really nice. There's a place for everything and everything can go in its place. There's even a little thing that you can use, a little like insert shelf thing that moves around the board with all the components if you don't like to just lay everything out on the table, which has it all nice and formulaic and you can just set it up based on the rules in there. Um, but overall, the quality and artwork for this game is excellent and I really, really enjoyed the gameplay. I think overall what this is gonna come down to is, is this the type of game for you? It's gonna fit into, I would, I would say like a certain appeal based on this type of mechanic of holding your breath, but I don't roll the game, rule the game out with utilizing this because I feel like I can basically hold my breath for as long as this is, and I think the, the average majority of people will be able to as well. And there's probably a slight advantage to being able to hold your breath longer, but I wouldn't say it's a huge amount of difference unless you can barely hold your breath. <laughs> but yes, overall, Black Mold is an excellent game. I love the feel to it. I love the theme. And I love how attached you feel to the game, its story, and what you're doing in the game. I think that's where it really stands out. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Black Mold. If you're interested, there's a link down below in the description. It's currently available on Kickstarter right now. You can also go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell notification button. It does greatly help us, and we do greatly appreciate it. Website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, six lists, and more. You can also go ahead and check out our live streams every Wednesday and Sunday, 6.30 p.m. PST. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, I look forward to escaping the black mold with you next time.